In my last breakdown of the First Contact movie, I analyzed the new Sovereign-class starship, the probable reasons for binging it in the conflict, and the mind state of Jean-Luc Picard. In this episode, we'll be looking at the actual battle of Sector 001 and some of the logical inferences we can make based on those facts. First, before we really examine this further, can I just say that this was one of the best presentations of the Borg. Finally, we get to see the Borg with a movie budget. The cube feels massive, its construction makes you feel like you can almost peer through it and see the inside, and it is just presented excessively formidable. Also, its course for Earth is chilling as we know what kind of damage it can do. The first few seconds of the battle tell us a lot about what is going on and the advancements of Starfleet as well. When looking at the timeline between Wolf 359 and now, we see what happens when you piss off the Federation. In just six short years, Starfleet technology went from not being able to even scratch the board, vessels just being swept aside like they are nothing, doing no damage, and over 30 ships being lost, to every shot causing substantial damage, and the board cube sustaining heavy injury to its outer hull. Every weapon that is fired from a ship has some significant impact. This is starkly different from past confrontations. And I do think there are a few reasons for this. We know that Starfleet immediately began constructing counters and weaponry after Wolf 359. Additionally, as stated, Dialogue in Deep Space Nine places this battle mere months before the Dominion War. And we also know that both the shielding and weaponry had been upgraded to defend against Dominion technologies, which appears to have come in handy here. While researching this, I have come upon some discussions and criticisms about the type of vessels that are in the battle, and their ability to inflict damage upon the cube. As an example, people have noted that we see both Mirandas and Oberths in the fight. To be frank, it's quite obvious to anyone that knows Star Trek that the Oberth were included in the battle because Starfleet Admirals wanted to get rid of those who had been loyal to former Admiral Layton during his coup but couldn't fire them. So the Admiral Chiefs simply sent these officers on suicide missions to take care of the problem. Secondly, given how easy it is for Starfleet to provide, uh, we'll call them minor refits, it is definitely possible, if not likely, that all ships had been given modifications that would allow them to fight the Borg. Most older vessels would be somewhat limited in the amount of modifications that could be done, sure, but they can at least guarantee that a vessel would cause some damage before being destroyed. Again, this isn't to say that these ships are preferable in the battle, as they are dispatched quite easily by the cube and obliterated in the Dominion War. However, they could still be a significant threat in the right situation. Looking at the battle proper, as stated, the board cube was getting the absolute hell beat out of it. Of course, the ship was getting its own hits in as well. Even with the upgrades, Starfleet vessels were still easy pickings. The ships were more working as annoying bees in a lot of ways. Effectively, the board cube was receiving death by a thousand cuts. The type of Starfleet technology was either doing so much damage that the Borg couldn't repair it fast enough, or it was designed in such a way to ensure that short-term repairs were impossible. Breaking down the battle itself, we see the Borg slowly making their way to Earth surrounded by Mirandas, the Defiant, Oberths, and more. In the last episode, I discussed how I felt like Starfleet likely was using picket lines, and I think this battle supports that idea. First, we know through dialogue that the fight likely didn't start at Earth. The Borg Cube was constantly pushing through Starfleet forces while they continued to fight and retreat. This strategy for the Federation ultimately seems to work out, though, because again, the Cube was being slowly whittled down. Wonderfully, in the conflict, we finally get to see the Defiant in its element. The ship was designed specifically to defeat the Borg. Its sleek and shorter profile makes it harder for the cube to lock onto it, allowing the vessel to work in strafing runs. Report. Watching this fight does somewhat highlight the weakness of the vessel. The Defiant, while powerful, is still excessively weak against a Borg cube by itself. These vessels were generally designed to fight in wolf packs, working in tandem. It would have been nice to see the Defiant using tactics with other Defiant-class vessels and just beating the hell out of the Borg. 
Unfortunately, the USS Defiant had been fighting for quite a while and was worse for the wear. Main power, shields, and weapons are all offline. Even though we did see the vessel just fire its weapons, we'll assume that that was probably just the last volley they had before the weapons were obliterated. During the battle, you can softly hear the Klingon themes fade in as Worf is introduced, pulling himself up from the floor. Report! Main power's offline! We've lost shields! Our weapons are gone! The darker tones, red alert klaxon sounding, the ominous music, the sounds of a ship being ripped apart from all sides, come together with the camera at a Dutch angle to show how dire the situation is. With the ship effectively disabled, Worf orders ramming speed. This does seem off to me. The ship likely won't do substantial damage, and Starfleet officers might not want to ram into the cube when they could still fight in other ways. Though, to play devil's advocate, with the Defiant's shields down, the Borg could beam aboard and start assimilating it. Additionally, the Borg cube is near destruction, so perhaps they think it might be the death knell to the cube itself, causing it to explode. I can see the argument on both sides. Also, it would probably help if Worf didn't use magical transportation magic to go from laying on the floor next to the chair to being magically in it sitting and looking at consoles. Might want to conserve power there, buddy. There have been a few interesting discussions regarding the fact that the Defiant was there. Some theorize that this might not have been the USS Defiant, but instead was the USS Sao Paulo engaging in the fight. I doubt that. Even though I'll admit the Sao Paulo being the ship makes a ton more sense as it allows the Defiant to be operational during the Deep Space Nine series. Additionally, the Sao Paulo was arguably closer and so wouldn't have to magically transport across the universe to get to Earth. However, dialogue makes it quite clear that this is the USS Defiant. Also, people have wondered why Starfleet would send what Red Letter Media calls the quote-unquote B-team to crew it. There are actually some good arguments to why this occurs. Think about it. If the Federation didn't allow Jean-Luc to participate in the battle, they sure as hell aren't going to allow Sisko to be there. But beyond that, I still stand by the fact that Starfleet was looking to the future. Like we see with the Enterprise-E, it's quite possible that Sisko was benched, possibly with the untested Sao Paulo at DS9. This was done on the off chance that Sisko would be needed as a strategic reserve or to pick up the pieces if Starfleet failed. Some also argue that Starfleet would send everything they have at the Borg, but as this battle shows, Starfleet had been preparing for the situation for years. The Federation wasn't exactly helpless this time. The situation was dire, but not unwinnable. Keeping some forces back, just in case, and not throwing everything you have immediately at the problem is probably wise. Wolf 359 sure as hell proved that. Lastly, the original script did call for the destruction of the Defiant. Luckily, Ira Bear fought this tooth and nail, saving our beloved ship. Thank God. But without further ado, on the minutia of the less than three minutes of the battle we've been analyzing, we finally get the money shot. With the Defiant disabled and about to ram the Borg vessel and ships getting tore apart, the Enterprise-E arrives. The Enterprise. Oh my god. Oh my god. Oh my god. Oh my god. Hell yeah. The Sovereign class vessel instantly is able to save the Defiant and make a more tempting target for the cube to focus on. Many have asked how the Enterprise could have arrived to Earth and gotten there in time. When we look at a map of the universe, which has largely been considered one of the few pieces of literature to be canon, and was ultimately canonized in Star Trek Picard, the Enterprise was crossing half the Beta Quadrant to get to Earth. Luckily, the warp drive of the Sovereign had been upgraded to that of the speed of plot, so it's not a big deal. Scanners show that the Defiant is dead in the water and needs assistance. Picard orders that they transport all the crew off the dying ship. Again, some have tried to argue that this doesn't make much sense. Given that the shields are up on the Enterprise and you wouldn't want to lower them against the Borg, how do you transport all those people? Well, there are a few ways to look at this. Since this occurs during DS9, we can take a look at that series to see how shields are operated. The series is notorious for calling out specific shield grids going down versus all of the shields failing. 
It is possible that the Enterprise simply lowered the shields facing the Defiant while keeping the ones facing the Borg up. I've also argued that transporter technology has progressed a lot from series to series. It's easy to see from Enterprise to the original series to TNG to DS9 and Voyager. We see in both The Next Generation and Voyager that it is possible to beam between ships even if both vessels have their shields up. You need but only the shield modulation to do this. And again, I have argued quite a bit that transporter technology has advanced tremendously. When it first appears in Star Trek Enterprise, it's a hazard to transport anything. When they have it in the original series, you never transport while at warp. And then in the next generation, this isn't a problem. So as time progresses, the transporter becomes more advanced. So it is likely that beaming through shields wasn't possible at that time because it was something that was a limitation, just training and technology that advanced to the point that it became not an issue. Additionally, later, Picard will say the Enterprise's shields were down and that's how the Borg got on board, so maybe tactical and transporter operations are just idiots and lowered the shields wholesale, I don't know. After dealing with the Defiant, it's determined that the Admiral's vessel is destroyed and that the Borg cube has sustained heavy damage to the outer hull with fluctuations to the power grid. Number one, open the channel to the fleet. Channel open, sir. This is Captain Picard of the Enterprise. I'm taking command of the fleet. Target all of your weapons onto the following coordinates. Fire at my command, sir. The coordinates you have indicated do not appear to be a vital system. Trust me, Data. Picard takes command of the fleet and orders the ships to target a specific part of the cube. First, it's interesting Data says that there doesn't appear to be a vital system where he's targeting. This is confusing because, well, the Borg don't have subsystems at all. The entirety of the Borg cube was the system. It was a major point in the next generation that the Borg were self-sufficient. There was no bridge, no engineering no weakness. However, this does seem to support an argument that I have long had, that the assimilation of Starfleet and the Federation weaken the Borg. Consider, the Borg look at Starfleet and the Federation and they see an entity that is thriving and always coming out on top, even though logically they shouldn't. There are many times in Trek's history where it makes no sense for Starfleet not to be obliterated, and if not for contrivance, the UFP would be no more. So they attempted to mimic what the Federation does, but ultimately that's faulty because the way Starfleet operates makes no sense and weakens you. And so the Borg start doing worse because they don't have the valuable, intangible plot armor that the heroes do. I am having a little bit of fun here, I'll admit, but I do believe that the existence of subsystems and other weaknesses the Borg now have is due to the influence of Starfleet. That the way Starfleet thinks, the way Federation officers are, their ideals somewhat poison the collective in a way. To be fair, according to Jonathan Frakes, the director, the original point of this was that the collective was tricking Jean-Luc, that they wanted to make it look like the Borg cube was destroyed because the plan all along was to go back in time and assimilate Earth. Too bad for Mr. Frakes that, for me, it only matters what occurs on screen. Death of the author for the win, motherfucker. The sustained attack is successful and the Borg cube is destroyed, unfortunately taking a Steam Runner class with it. Before its destruction, a sphere would launch and make its way towards Earth. The Enterprise would follow in pursuit. Some have asked why the rest of the fleet didn't follow as well. Technically, I think they probably did. Remember, the Enterprise would be protected because it was in the way. It was the closest to the sphere and so might have had that protection. The other ships that were in pursuit probably were wiped away because they weren't within the wake. While following the sphere, it's determined that the Borg went back in time and assimilated Earth. During this point, Worf would insist on being on the bridge and of course is giving command of tactical. With a few jabs by Riker on if Worf remembers how to use tactical, we're off to the races following the sphere. Ultimately, the sphere would go back in time and the Enterprise would follow it straight on. Buckle up, buckaroos. In the next installment, we'll discuss how the Borg went back in time to save the Federation.